OK, so uh, if you think about what are the challenges that, that we have in the 21st century, and you just Google 21st century challenges, you can come up with a list of challenges, and healthcare was uh, discussed today early in the morning. And if you go through challenge by challenge, you will see that materials and molecules are key to them. Right? For example, water filtration, we, we, we would love to have lower cost water filtration membranes. We would love to have degradable plastics. We would love to have better drugs, right? So the question is, how can we, as, as academics and, and entrepreneurs, uh, think of this market as a potential uh, uh, benefit to society? So one of the things is benefit to society. The other one is to make money. According to this uh, Barron's article, there's three technologies that could be a trillion dollars large. Okay? One of them is quantum computing. I have a startup on that. One of them is AI for materials, and the other one is CRISPR. So I just need to create a startup in CRISPR. But this is what it says about AI for materials, right? If you actually can accelerate uh, the pace of materials discovery, we could actually have uh, a new market of startups that do stuff rather than do dog walk walking applications. Uh, there's a very beautiful article that by David Rothman in the MIT Technology Review that talks about AI and its relationship with the scientific method. Uh, we are talking about a lot about how AI can impact, uh, for example, how we treat patients, but not too many people are thinking about why and how we can use AI to change the way we discover things, right? Because if we, if we can use AI to actually accelerate just the way scientists do their slow work, maybe scientists become more productive and actually uh, there will be more scientific outcomes in this era that we need it. So uh, in, my, in my job, um, it's a challenging uh, task because roughly, if you put a person to try to make a random molecule for six months with available reagents that you can buy, there's about 10 to the 180 molecules. That's about 100 orders of magnitude more than the number of visible atoms in the universe. So it's basically practically infinite, right? And the solution to all the problems I'll tell you about lies in that vast space. And the typical throughput of research in my laboratory and others is uh, shown here in the slides. We can roughly study data sets of millions of molecules with machine learning. Uh, humanity as a whole has made about 100 million molecules or so. Uh, we can calculate the quantum mechanical properties of 100,000 of them or a million of them routinely. But you know, if a human is actually paging for molecules, about a thousand of them, then just become distracted. It's like looking at Tinder or something. Like after a thousand different pictures, you lose lose attention. It's the same thing. And even worse, actually, how many molecules can you actually make in a laboratory? It's about a handful. So in a lot of my projects, I end up with making and testing maybe 10, 20, 30 molecules. So you see this immense model, uh, funnel of orders of magnitude, how to search chemical chemical space. So in my own personal research, I'm very interested in these applications, applications that have to do with energy. We have to hope uh, an energy transition, actually uh, uh, me, uh, following uh, Mar Marzia's comments. I think in Canada, we have to wean off uh, oil. Okay, so we have to think about uh, solar energy, we have to think about batteries. And uh, those are examples I have worked on. We developed an organic flow battery, and we have developed uh, uh, organic uh, photovoltaics. I'll tell you a little bit about them. So if you think about the process of, of taking a material to market, the typical numbers, uh, the more research I'm doing, is about 20 years and $20 million, okay? roughly, give or take, depending on the material, to, from the scientific discovery to the first uh, uh, applications in the market. So even if I come out today with a molecule to harvest sunlight or to store energy, it would take 20 years to actually deploy to market. So let's think a little bit about, about uh, Elon Musk and his boring company that tries to make tunnels on the cities by trying to lower factors of 10 in the cost of boring tunnels, maybe we can think about taking factors of 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, maybe even 10 in the different aspects of materials discovery so that we can take it. And my personal goal is in five years to take it to one year and one million. Okay, just a factor of 10 by getting factors of 2 and 3 in different aspects of this. And the reason I'm, uh, uh, I want to do that is because a lot of the venture capitalists in the room will be more interested in investing in companies that do this. If we lower it, even that factor of 10, then if I tell you it's going to take 20 years and $20 million to maybe come up with a material uh, following Josh's talk about risk. Right? So hopefully we can lower the risk. And if we f get another factor of 10, then really we can enable a new economy of materials discovery, democratizing the idea of coming up with new perfumes, new materials, new drugs, et cetera. Right? So for that, we need to actually bring AI as deep in the process of discovery to manufacture as possible. So in my lab and other people around the world are thinking about how to accelerate the synthesis by using robotics. 
how to accelerate the device fabrication, and how to accelerate the testing of molecules, right? So um, this is an example of my own lab, this uh, organic flow battery took m my collaborators and myself about $5 million of federal funding in five years to come up with finally one of the two sides of a battery to store the world's energy. So we, basically, if you extrapolate, it will take us another five years or so, and $5 million, to get to the other side of the battery, and then maybe another 10 years to take this first metal-free battery and deploy it you know, uh, to store the world's energy. So if you take the idea of, we like to call them self-driving laboratories, uh, we want to close the loop in the decision-making of the lab as soon as possible. Unlike the high-throughput screening of the 90s and 2000s, where people did a lot of experiments and they looked at the data, we argue that making a handful of experiments, making a smart decision about what, where to go next, uh, is a better strategy for navigating chemical space. And that we call that a closing the loop, and we call the general strategy self-driving laboratories. Is this possible? Well, I argue it's actually possible. Uh, the people in biology already did it. They actually lower the cost of sequencing genomes in a beyond Moore's law scaling, and they took it from $100 million to about $1,000 per, per genome, right? And that uh, is way beyond what you would expect from even uh, exponential Moore's law scaling. So we need this for materials. We have about 10 years uh, for climate change uh, to actually keep affecting us even more and more. And um, that's where I think we, we all have to get together as scientists and solve this problem. So in a workshop that I ran in Mexico City, we came up with this uh, idea of basically then integrating how the laboratories should look like. And on my move to Toronto here, we started building a lab that actually pre is predicated on these things. Uh, we have automated synthesis, uh, automatic characterization, uh, connected to our quantum chemistry and machine learning tools. So we developed this software called ChemOS that uh, is free to use for uh, scientists around the world to actually try to do that in your own laboratory. So you can go ahead and download ChemOS today. In pharma, this is called the Make, Test, Design, and Analyze cycle. And uh, uh, basically, in pharma, is in the same type of, uh, you know, re-imagining uh, how they can actually lower the cost, which is about $2 billion to take a drug to market. Uh, so now, uh, let me tell you a little bit about uh, uh, a, a movie that maybe you, have, you might have watched. It's called Blade Runner. It happens uh, in 2019, and uh, the topics are AI and robotics, uh, very, very, uh, uh, modern topics uh, today. This, uh, and this uh, uh, Blade Runner called Deckard has the job of identifying and killing androids. This is his data set. Um, and turns out this is the answer. This is the classification of android or human, and he has to kill the androids. And the main philosophical question in this movie is if he himself is a human or an android. The reason I'm telling you about this is because there's two machine learning tasks that, that, that I want to tell you about. The task that many people think about drug design or malaria design is the first task, a classification or regression of thinking if a molecule is going to be good or bad for something. But I'm very interested in the second type of models that Marzi already talked to you about. They're called generative models. These are models that Bati has to use, in principle, I guess, to actually mimic the human behavior and not to be killed by the, by the android. Right? So we introduce generative models to chemistry as a very interesting tool to actually navigate chemical space. Okay? Because uh, uh, high throughput virtual screening is kind of like shooting a machine gun in the very, very vast chemical space, whereas with inverse design, which is how we call it in my field, uh, you can actually take a property and try to find out, based on that property and the best estimate of our model, what would be the best molecule to make. Learn from the mistakes or successes of that molecule and then go ahead and make the next molecule. So this is the adoption of AI uh, technology in a new domain, the, the domain of molecules. Turns out our papers became very, very popular because Molecules look like graphs, and many people in machine learning are thinking about graphs, for example, for social networks and other aspects. So there's a lot of people that are thinking about graph representations, and molecules seem, seem to be kind of one of the now canonical examples. And here are pictures of some of the typical technologies that we recently reviewed in this paper in science with my student, Benjamin, uh, of how you can use these models to actually come up with new molecules, like androids dreaming uh, electric molecules, right? So. Uh, Let's just talk about one model that I really, really like. It's an autoencoder. And the reason I like this model is that at the beginning, it sounds like a very stupid thing to do because you're training a model to repeat the same data it sees. So when I tell an organic chemist, I want to make a model that takes benzene and reproduces benzene, an organic chemist will say, why are you doing this, Alan? That sounds like super boring. Well, what it's actually doing is compressing the information of a discrete set of objects, in this case, molecular graphs, into a 200-dimensional differentiable continuous space, so it takes discrete points into a continuous space reversibly. That's a new part. 
So I can go to that space and leak that space to property prediction, say uh, drug efficacy or Matthias performance, maximizing that surface, go to the maximum in that surface, and then backtrack and figure out in that particular latent space which molecule is the molecule that has that high performance. And then again, what I'm trying to predicate is that then we have robots that actually go make it, test it quickly, and then move on and actually optimize this model, right? So for example, if you want to think about how chemical space looks like in those 200 dimensions, here I'm showing you this uh, 200 dimensional ring of Saturn around ibuprofen. And you can see this molecular distance metric. This is the roughly the value is 20, and you can see more or less typical molecules around ibuprofen that, that look like that. And to navigate this chemical space, you have to move around this Saturn ring of data. And you can optimize, and you can go from a very low point to a very high point. And uh, so far, this was academic. Uh, we published a paper in the archive in 2016. In 2018, it was finally published in the journal, uh, thanks to reviewer number three. Uh, and uh, then we started working with my friend Alex Shavoronkov. This paper was mentioned uh, earlier on. He used our technology, which is this autoencoder technology, uh, and improved upon it in a company called In Silico AI. And I was kind of like their external consultant, uh, collaborator, et cetera. And we put ourselves to the challenge of, OK, if we're saying that this is possible, let's put our money where where our mouth is, and actually try to accelerate the process of drug candidate identification. So in about 40 days, including the, the, the testing in animals, we were able to find three candidates as for inhibitors for DDR1 kinase, which has, has to do with muscular uh, dystrophy. Now, this uh, is just a proof of concept. That's a simple receptor. People in the internet got pretty you know, threatened by this, and Twitter became very active, because one of the molecules we discovered is very similar to another molecule somewhere in the references, it's one of the list of molecules. What is exciting about this paper is that the technology allows you to do this. And of course, many other companies are developing similar technologies, and this is just the beginning. And also, another point to make is that this is just one of the aspects of our discovery. I've been uh, arguing that you need to actually include several of these speed ups in different aspects of our discovery, all the way down to the clinical trials that we heard about. Okay, so this is again, what I like about this picture is this is again the same autoencoder that we propose for molecular design. Now it's an adversarial version of it with a lot of different filters generating this molecular matter that can be tested and synthesized. Uh, so can this only be done uh, for, for, for uh, uh, molecules? No, well, in this uh, paper that just came out uh, a couple months ago, we show the first time you can use an autoencoder to actually pro produce uh, uh, solids. So this is uh, uh, how we do it. We have one autoencoder for a unit cell. Uh, together with another autoencoder for the atomic positions and atomic identities. And that allows us to actually predict new phases of matter. Uh, we looked at the space of vanadium oxides and trained a model on a, a data from the Matthias project. And we're able to predict these phases of vanadium oxide that potentially could be stable and have not been observed. So uh, if you want to think about what materials are in the crust of the Earth or possible new catalysts or possible new solid state uh, solutions for, say, uh, alloys for, for cars and so on, you could imagine using these models that imagine themselves, uh, in, in turn, uh, new materials that you could potentially uh, manufacture. So this is just the beginning also of thinking about how to use these technologies for solid state materials. Um, so now, how about the automation part? So this is when I moved to Canada. Uh, the government of Canada uh, gave us a large amount of funding, Natural Resources Canada, to work with my colleagues at UBC to build a self-driving laboratory to do thin films, more in the processing aspect. So we designed this robot called Ada, okay, very, uh, and it's all using Canadian technology, including Canadian robot arms, to actually make and test uh, film film materials. So here they are. Uh, okay, I guess the video is not working. Okay, somebody's clicking on it, but you can see this machine that was basically bottom-up built, uh, very inexpensively modular, uh, mixing precursors, uh, putting all sorts of chemicals together in a little thin film uh, in a process called spin coating. That usually is done by hand. You have these artisans that spin coat, these solar cells that spin coat, uh, all sorts of materials for energy. Arguably, every energy technology requires a thin film somewhere, right? And the question is, can we have these low-cost uh, laboratories that actually can accelerate what graduate students used to do by hand? So there's a lot of collaborators in the world that, and us that are thinking about that, and we're building one here in Toronto. Uh, uh, I'm showing you the one in Vancouver, and etc. And this robot, Ada, is being more and more augmented with different tools. It has four-point contact testing, um, it has uh, uh, you know, image recognition for actually looking at the film quality. And it has allowed us to actually use our Bayesian models to actually 
explore this space, and you can see here in this picture, this is just a two-dimensional exploration using the robot, one of the first ones, that shows you how we can actually optimize the annealing time and concentration of dopants to actually make a high-performance thin film and actually replace the work of a graduate student that could have been done in a year or two in a matter of weeks. So this will actually increase the productivity for grad students in Canada. This is another example that we recently put out together. Uh, going back to the solar cells made of plastic, if you actually take uh, uh, these uh, plastic materials, uh, uh, the question is, can I find uh, quaternary blends? Okay? Because people have been thinking about blending these materials, but just basically one or two or three of them, because the space of blending more and more materials has actually become more and more complicated. So the question is, can I combine more and more materials, and you can see here is an unfolded tetrahedron of materials, right, into actually uh, making more stable organic solar cells. So here is an example of a Deacon robot yeah, from my friend Christoph Brabeck in Germany. They use our ChemOS software to optimize the material. Uh, this is uh, basically a cross-section of the tetrahedron of composition. And in that particular case, our AI-driven discovery was actually 34 faster, 30 times faster than if we actually built a grid in the tetrahedron, as high-throughput experimentation was able to do that. So that allows you to use less material, less time, and reach to solution faster if you actually use a tool like ChemOS. Of course, also for drug discovery, we're working with Merck in process optimization. Here is ChemOS connected to a robot, connected to an HPLC mass spec. My collaborator at Merck, uh, Melanie, uh, uh, Melody, Melody Christensen, loved it so much that she, that, uh, she added a snapshot filter to it uh, <laughs> for the magic of ChemOS. Uh, so there you see this ChemSpeed robot uh, acquiring data and optimizing uh, catalytic reaction for drug production. Okay, so in one run of ChemOS, this is the first run. We already work 5% better at E to EPR ratio while minimizing the catalyst load, et cetera. So we had about 15 variables that we we're working on here, categorical and continuous variables. And then the second run increased another factor of 5% over the state of the art of Merck. So I argue that uh, these are very interesting examples because I already told you examples that have to do with the discovery of the material itself in the first part of the talk. I told you about drugs. Uh, how to make the matter uh, in the computer, think about it, solid state materials. Then I told you about devices, for example, thin film devices that can allow you to test if you are going to have a better solar cell. And now I'm also showing you something that has to do with production. Once you identify the molecule, you know it works in a device, how can you maximize uh, the yield in a process that's going to be uh, going to production? So you can see how AI can actually impact several of the different aspects of the materials or drug discovery cycle. And it's just a question of inserting it on it and actually working on it, which leads me to our startup, Kebotix, uh, which is a startup that is actually trying to do that for particular verticals in the materials industry, and aims to be, perhaps, controversially, uh, with respect to AJ, the one that holds all the power in the chemical industry, right? And hopefully we become like the next 3M or something like that, right? So that's our goal, to displace these incumbent, slow materials companies that are not using AI uh, the way they should to. So, AJ, thank you for inspiring me. That's the next goal of, of, of Kebotics, to concentrate all the power in the chemical industry. And with that, I want to thank uh, my research group and my, and, and my company co-founders. Uh, and thank you for your time.